It is time for our first issue after issue 100, and the shift in the look and feel of Nintendo Power that came with it, with Nintendo Power issue 101 for October 1997. And no, there are no Dalmatians in this issue. Well, before Nintendo brings out their own F-Zero game, instead, on the cover of Nintendo Power, we have a N64 version of one of the games aiming with that throne with Extreme G. In the letters column, we have a bunch of letters discussing the Rumble Pack and its impact on play, mainly with Star Fox 64. In the power charts, 007 is top of the charts on the N64, and with Doom 64 returning to the charts as well, with first-person shooters really starting to make their presence known. Also, the Super Nintendo has its first new title in a very long time, with Harvest Moon. Nothing new on the Game Boy, though. Well, it's time to kick things off with our cover game. Extreme G, a high-speed futuristic racing game on the N64. We have a rundown of all eight of the vehicles you can control, include in addition to the single and multiplayer gameplay modes. We also have course descriptions, but not course maps. On the one hand, Extreme G has a comparable sense of speed to F-Zero, particularly by using the 3D environments the N64 is capable of, but putting a lot of track geometry into the game that just simply couldn't be done on the SNES. Um, with any degree of speed, as we saw with Stunt Race FX. And consequently, it can give that stronger sense of speed because all these little twists and turns in the track can give a sense that more ground is being covered because you're not necessarily able to see it. On the other hand, though, because the N64 also has its problems with draw distances, they also can cause that sense of speed to backfire because you create situations where obstacles are thrown in front of the player literally faster than they can react. Either obstacles that are intrinsic to the level design, sharp turns, jumps, and places where the track either narrows and contracts or loop the loops or that sort of thing, or corkscrews, or weapons from the other racers. And this actually leads to the other to the real problem here. The inclusion of weapons, something that F-Zero did not have, both as power-ups and just items built into the vehicles that can leave the track something of a mess. For example, on the last race in the first circuit, some weapon power-ups were deployed very early in the lap that caused everyone's speed to slow down to a crawl, then in turn causing everyone to not have enough speed to go over a jump that is very early in the track, causing everyone to, to tumble off to their death, or reset as it were, on the other side of that jump with zero speed. It felt almost bizarre. Yep, using a turbo boost there wouldn't would have circumvented that on my part, but as a player, I'm unaccustomed to everything turning into an absolute fluster cluck that early in the race. Normally, by, it takes some time to pick up weapon power-ups and that sort of thing for everything to kind of work its way out in that way. And most games design their tracks to prevent that from happening. It saves those um, particular messes for later in the game, oftentimes not at the beginning of a track, but at the end as an opportunity for quick turnarounds and a way for uh, recovery by the player or by the AI. It's still fun, but it's also got it, but this handful of oversights leaves Extreme G feeling like a pretender to F-Zero's throne, who holds the seat not beyond its own merits, but because the king is absent. And once the king arrives, they will quickly and easily reclaim the throne. Well, Square may have left the N64 behind, but Enix has not. So they are publishing Treasure's new game for the N64, Mischief Makers. As this is a 2.5D platformer, this fits with the old school Nintendo Power map style, the screenshot map variety. So we have maps in addition to level nodes for the first three worlds of the game, along with some information on getting each level's A and S rank part times. We also get information where to find all the gold gems in each level because you need to get all of the gold gems in order to see the full ending. So, Mischief Makers is about half of a fun 2.5D platformer. Half that's fun is the general running, jumping, and grabbing things, and shaking and throwing them at, at enemies, and all that good stuff. However, the moment things get more complex, in terms of navigating the game's environments, things become more of a mess. It feels like it's odd to say this, but like the more complicated the controls get for Treasure's games, and the more complex the traversals get because of it, it feels like things become more of a problem for them. Gunstar Heroes was a game about running and shooting. Guardian Heroes was a belt-scrolling beat-em-up, and neither was particularly involved in their controls. You, both of them basically more or less were like two or three button games. On the other hand, Mischief Makers feels like it's tried to use every part of the damn controller, and because of that, it doesn't work. 
To the game's credit though, this is the most heavily anime game to come out on a Nintendo console and in the West as this point. We have the game having an opening cutscene for the first world that has the character need to be rescued, the professor, in the inside of a spaceship that is clearly modeled after a small Japanese apartment complete with a kotatsu. That was a very nice touch, and at this point, I am glad that US publishers, be it Enix or anyone else, were aware enough of the growing US anime fandom that they felt that felt more comfortable having openly Japanese elements be present in the game without feeling that having a Japanese style apartment, for example, wouldn't seem too foreign and um, God's going to have to spend additional money and so forth to eliminate that element of the game, as with Power Blade back on the NES. Next up is the winner of Nintendo Power's Games of the Future contest, which tries to envision what people will be playing in 2064. In this case, a sort of VR headset that runs on cartridges and has a direct neural interface. Um, created by the winner, Julius Harper Jr. from California. Doing some light Googling, Harper did done all right from here. He's got an IMDb page and has done some production work with the entertainment industry, including apparently some involvement with, well, a game in the form of um, Bandersnatch on Netflix or Black Mirror Bandersnatch, rather. So that that's pretty cool. In the classified information column, we find out what levels you have to um, defeat in what gameplay modes and with what completion time to get what cheats unlocked in GoldenEye 007. With the also added note that you can only use those cheats on replays. You can't, once you've unlocked unlimited ammunition, you can't just go play the rest of the game for it um, with it. So you'll have to use a game shark code for that. We have another 3D fighting game on the N64. This one is a weapon based fighter like Soul Edge or Toshinden uh, with Mace the Dark Age. We have notes on each of the playable characters in the game, several of whom have fairly orientalist character designs like the, like, well, Namira, who's wearing translucent harem pants and a bikini top, uh, in addition to the equally scantily clad Kunoichi, who's one of the playable characters as well. Maze the Dark Age is frankly not as good as the Soul Edge or Caliber games, or even the Tekken or Virtua Fighter series. Instead, it feels like, well, Midway's doing a dry run for something like Mortal Kombat 4, particularly related to how distressingly limited some of the movement is, um, and how it can be kind of tricky to do some basic stuff like blocking. Honestly, it feels like I kind of wish that Namco and Nintendo had been on better terms, so you would have had later gotten a N64 release of some of the Tekken games, the same way that we eventually got an N64 Wipeout game from Psygnosis. Speaking of mending fences and so forth and so on, Madden has finally come to the N64 with Madden 64. Now, this game has the Players Association license, but not the team license, so teams are only identified by city. Fortunately, unlike with baseball, we don't have multiple teams in the same city, no football equivalent of the Subway series here. So that should be pretty straightforward. You only got one New York, you only got one Seattle, you only got one, at this point, Los Angeles, because I believe, I think we might have the Chargers and the Rams at this point. Um, no, actually the Chargers would still be in San Diego, I think. Um, so only one Los Angeles team. Here, the main focus is on the adjustments to career mode for this version of the game. So I've played a fair number of Madden games over the years on older consoles like the SNES and newer consoles like the PlayStation 3 and, 4, and PlayStation 2, even for that matter. Um, and I'm probably the worst of all of them that I've played at Madden 64. And I'm not entirely sure why. I don't know if it's an issue with it being trickier for your receivers to get free of coverage, or if it uses just a bit too much of a delay for hitting the input for your kick, or what have you. Also, this game uses most of a memory pack, like 122, 123 slots on the memory pack. Um, I tried clearing some space out of mine with like a whole, getting rid of a whole bunch of duplicate saves, and still didn't have enough room. So, if you do buy a copy of this, maybe pick up a spare memory pack to go with it. Or, I know that Polymega still hasn't shipped a lot of their base systems yet, but like using Polymega's um, uh, N64 thing um, add-on for the uh, for their system 
to deal with the whole, you know, memory cart thing and limited space. Anyway, I do remember hearing stuff about this being the worst of the Madden series, and my experiences would kind of bear that out. Though admittedly, having my first game as the Seahawks, which admittedly, I don't remember how good they were at this time, but I was up against the Dallas Cowboys when I forgot that this was one of the Cowboys' best lineups of all time with Aikman as QB and Deion Sanders as a receiver. I admit I probably walked into getting a thoroughly stomped there. Moving on, we have a preview of an import game for the N64 with Last Legion UX. This is a mech action game from Hudson, which looks like it takes some cues from Virtual On, particularly played with two controllers for the mech. The replicate the dual uh, analog stick control scheme for the arcade version of the game. Um, this game has apparently gotten like a very loose translation patch. So I may later, um, when we hit the end of Nintendo of uh, the N64's first year, um, see about taking a look at some of these import games. But we'll see when we get there. We have some more uh, gameplay coverage for Tetrisphere of this issue, which I reviewed a couple episodes back, so I'm not going to worry about covering it here. We also have some more coverage of Arrow Fighters Assault, which I've already covered a while back, probably when it was a preview instead of a review, but, ah, uh, well, water under the bridge or wind through the windmill? I don't know. Anyway, the article has notes on several of the game's levels, improved dogfighting notes, and also the multiplayer mode. We have a more conventional racing game with... F1 Pole Position 64, published by Ubisoft and developed by Human, the Fire Pro Wrestling people. We have some notes and I pick a car for the game, and some discussion of technique, including how cornering works in racing, along with some basic maps of the game's tracks. F1 Pole Position 64 does try to be a considerably more simulationist racing game, complete with supporting a driving wheel. However, it's not as good as being a racing game, particularly with the controller, as I'd like. Steering controls are a little too sensitive and wiggly than what we've gotten on racing games on the Super Nintendo and, N and NES, in part because the shift for the analog stick instead of a D-pad, though the option is there. But there isn't quite enough forgiveness in other elements of the game, particularly driving AI of your opponents, to make up for it. That said, I really appreciate the selection of real-world tracks in the game, especially the Nürburgring. Um, I don't know if this is the first place where we get it, but it, I'm glad it's here. I'm not going to switch from, say, PS1 Gran Turismo as my top racing game or simulationist racing game of this era, but I do very much appreciate what this game does. We have some notes on the Nintendo versions of Arkanoid and Space Invaders, which I have previously covered as the Game Boy versions that worked under the uh, Super Game Boy. We have another SNES Disney minigame collection with Timon and Pumbaa's jungle games, which I'm going to give a miss because this and this feels like shovelware. And I feel like I got to draw the line at some point, especially because eventually I'm going to come to the Wii and we're going to have to talk about Wii games. Next is Tamagotchi for the Game Boy a collection sort of a, of. I guess I'd call it like a upgraded and expanded version of the classic Tamagotchi LCD game, which is just recently out in the big happening thing at this point which adds some of the elements of raising sims like Princess Maker on the Game Boy. Again, unfortunately, because of how I do this show, this isn't a game that necessarily is conducted for review in this way, because it's going to require a very long extended time with the game um, to really get a feel for it, because they have a time to do things. And I can't walk around with an emulator in my pocket in the same way as I could with this. So there's that. Mortal Kombat 2 are getting a port for the Game Boy again, or rather a bundle of the previous two releases in one cartridge. And again, I've covered both of those previously, so once again, this gets a miss. No also runs this issue in the Now Playing column. And in Pack Watch, we have a look at Diddy Kong Racing, along with the upcoming second Kirby game for the Super Nintendo, showing that that platform still has some life left in it. So my pick of this issue is also kind of by default. Specifically, Extreme G. It does exactly what it's trying to do, and it does so very well. It just needs polish. Uh, it's certainly learned a lot about how to handle 
well, handling and control from the first couple of Wipeout games on the PlayStation 1. There is room for improvement, however, both with the sequel and with others following in the game's slipstream, whether it is um, future Extreme G games, the, N the upcoming N64 version of Wipeout, and of course, Nintendo's own F064. But next month, more football. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the show, please like and subscribe. I also consider backing my Patreon. Patreon backers get episodes up to one week early of this show and any future Let's Plays. Also, please consider backing my coffee. Uh, toss me a few bucks, also helps support the show, and it's not a monthly obligation or anything like that.